Hello, I'm Deborah Pope, Executive Director of the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation. And along with our co-host, the DeGrum and Children's Literature Collection, I'm very happy to welcome you to this webinar, Latinx Kidlet, Meet the Makers, one event in our year-long celebration of the 35th anniversary of the Ezra Jack Keats Award. I'm also very proud that all three panelists, Zeke Pena, Juana martinez Neal, and Bianca Diaz are all Ezra Jack Keats Award honorees. These three artists make it look easy to create outstanding illustrations for children's books. But that is the mark of great talent to make something difficult look easy. And that's why this webinar is gonna be a real treat. We're gonna be able to see behind the curtain just a little bit what it takes to make the illustrations that go into the children's books that will become the classics of the future. I want you to know we're recording this event and it'll live on the Ezra Jack Keats website for you, for those you recommend it to, and for those who couldn't be here today. That's it for me now, but I will come back at the end. Now it's time to get the show on the road. Ramona, it's all yours. Thank you, Deborah. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be talking with these wonderful artists about their studio spaces and creative processes. So let's get the conversation started. To kick things off, I'm going to ask each speaker to introduce their Ezra Jack Keats Award honoree book in only five words, and then to tell us a little bit about how receiving this award and the mission of the award influence what they're thinking as they go into their studio space every day to create. Zeke, do you want to get us started? Uh, my name is Zeke Benya, and I'm the illustrator of My Papi Has a Motorcycle or Mi Papi Tiene Una Moto, written by my good friend Isabel Quintero. And in five words, this book is A Fun Ride with Daisy. Um, and yeah, the award was really special to me. I think as a self-taught illustrator, um, you know, I have, you know, I'm working on this process and, you know, learning a lot about publishing. And I think that this award was really special because it really legitimizes that practice. And I think it also legitimizes the story that's in there that, that Isabel has written. And so I was really grateful to be on a, on a great list with some amazing illustrators and authors. Terrific. Thanks so much. How about you, Juana? Hi, how are you? I am Juana Martinez Neal. I am an author and illustrator, and I this is my debut picture book, which also got Ezra Jack Keats honor for writing uh, Alma and how she got her name. That is also in Spanish as Alma y como obtuvo su nombre. If I were to put the the book into words, I would say pride in who you are. Um, and I think the Ezra Jack Kids Award has helped me, has given me the confidence that I needed as, you know, given that this was my first book, it gave me the confidence that I needed to continue working and um, trust my instinct. Yeah, making that transition from illustrating other people's books to writing and illustrating your mm -hmm. own is huge. <laughs> and Bianca, how about you? Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. I'm Bianca Diaz and my children's book is The One Day House or La Casa de Algún Día, uh, written by uh, Julia Durango. I guess the award made me feel just validated and uh, happy to know that it will make it that much easier for librarians and teachers and, and therefore children to access my work. Um, so I was very happy to win the award and it, it gives me a renewed sense of purpose when I think about it. Okay, thank you so much for that quick look into your books. And now we're going to be able to go into your actual workspaces and see where Juana, Zeke, and Bianca create their amazing picture books. This is my studio. So here's the desk, and then this is my box for crafting. So I made like this couch, and it's part of the lovely Fiesta collection. And I made this TV. You can turn the knobs. This inspires me. It just takes my mind off like um, work, I guess. Um, and then this is a, some books that I really like. This one I love because it's like a pillow. This is like uh, the most inspiring one to me, Tar Beach by Faith Ringgold. And I just really love it. Like this, this spread especially, 
like this pattern is so nice with all these textures and um i like family focused books and neighborhood focused books and i have this lamp that i really love and that lamp because i like to work at night um which is bad for lighting and color so i have i got more lamps but i like working at night because it um just nobody's awake and it's way easier to focus and just like get in that zone and uh, especially being in New York, I feel like I'm part of the ecosystem of the night. So I am in an interesting position right now. I recently moved. So my workspace is not quite set up as it normally is. So I've been in a lot of spaces over the years. And with the pandemic, I'm working from home. I don't have a studio right now that I can go to. Um, but that's okay, I just keep it simple. I'm on a temporary folding table right now. I also enjoy working from remote places, like going to the library or going to a tea shop to uh, just set up quickly my laptop and sketch pad and my tablet. This is really easy for me to pack up and put in my backpack. As you can see on the wall behind me, I like to keep things on the walls for inspiration. I have toys around all the time, small toys. Uh, those are just fun distractions for me. Um, if I'm working on something and I need a distraction to take a break. This is our dog Luna. Hi Luna. One of the things that I use a lot in my workspace are these clipboards. So I like to use these to keep projects that I'm working on organized. This is where I'll keep, you know, pencil sketches, uh, notes. There's some other thumbnails. Uh, I like to keep these little post-it notes for things that I find in other videos, just little reminders. Uh, this is one of the action figures that I'll use to pose in different positions if I need something, uh, our point of reference for some anatomy. Hi there, how are you? Welcome to my studio um, here in Arizona. Before I work on, you know, in the kitchen table or in the dining room table or next to the crib and in the spare bedroom. But this was my first space for just working. So we added glass doors and skylights because to me, having lots of lights in the room was very important. From that table that you see back there, that table is my working table. That's where I made every book. This is my thing, <laughs> toys. Um, I have all kinds of toys. This is from when I was 12. I bought it when I was 12 for Christmas. I collect toys and I collect dolls. This one, this one I love. I'll show you. And I love this doll because she, she has a yellow button. The shelf right here has my works. It has the Robert F. Seibert and the Buddha Belpre and then the Ezra Jackies. We have my cover corner for Alma. I have made every book that is published in this room. From La Madrigus to La Princesa and the Pea to Alma, Baby Moon, Friedrich, Swashbees. Sonia. Now I'm working on Tomato Formula and um, another book that will be coming in 2022. That was terrific. I learned so much about the spaces in which these three illustrators and writers do their work. Mm -hmm. Bianca, I noticed that you had, and I was really excited to see that you had Faith Ringgold's Tar Beach in your studio because that's one of my favorites too, as well as being another Ezra Jack Keats Award recipient. Juana and Zeke, do you have any favorite books, either now or books that you remember really loving as kids? Juana, you want to get started? <laughs> yeah, uh, growing up, El Principito, The Little Prince, that's my favorite book. Uh, when I was 18, 100 years, 100 years of solitude. And then books now, I have so many. I have my shelves of like, you know, how much I love them. And that's how I sort them in my, on my bookshelves. <laughs> Does that require a lot of rearranging then? I would constantly be going in. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I, I also sort my books by illustrator, not by author. So, you know, that's, a, that's an illustrator thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
Zeke, how about you? I don't know that people always consider it to be like a picture book, but uh, Bill Watterson, uh, Calvin and Hobbes has always been, you know, is always a really big thing for me as a young person. I think a lot of the reading for me happened in uh, newspapers on Sundays, like reading the comic strips and stuff. Uh, and I think Calvin and Hobbes was definitely one of the ones that I was uh, uh, an avid reader of, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a question for all of you. Did you plan to become a children's book illustrator or was it some sort of fortuitous, wonderful accident for all of us? I personally did plan to. I always loved children's books growing up and I went to uh, Rhode Island School of Design for Illustration and um, just always loved children's books. So it was for me definitely a lifelong dream. Um, I did not have picture books growing up. So I did not know I could be a picture book uh, illustrator. Um, I think my life would have been very different if I would have known. <clears throat> so I had to actually go around my life finding until I found that, which I did when I was, you know, later in, that, in my life. So I was, you know, in my mid to late thirties uh, when I found picture books. Yeah. For me, it was something I was kind of circling around my whole life. Um, being into comics and comic strips when I was younger my dad got me into comics and um, it was something that I was trying to explore but I went through a bunch of different uh, you know jobs and I went through I guess a very windy path to get there mm -hmm. um, and I think that it was the culmination of all of the you know illustration covers and editorial things and posters for bands and things like that where I was really getting my you know schooling on how to illustrate narrative work. Yeah, it was a long windy path, but it was something I always wanted to do. Here's a fun question. How often do you need to start over while you're doing your illustrations? And what materials are your favorite to be working with, maybe at all the different stages of shaping one of your books? Juana, do you wanna get that one started? Sure, uh, for, I love sketching. I really love sketching a lot and my, I have a very specific paper that I love because of the color of the actual paper. I love certain colors. So I, you know, it was about to go out of print. So I just, you know, bought a whole stack. So I don't know what I'm gonna do when I run out of them. <laughs> and then pencils, I go 4B and app. I like, I like really dark and soft pencils and my finger. <laughs> I use all my hand when I paint, yeah, when I draw. Yanka? <laughs> I um, do have to start over sort of a lot, but I try to minimize that by um, sketching like pretty thoroughly and figuring it out in that process just with pencil. So I'm not really starting over when I um, finally get to paint and I uh, love to use watercolor and color pencil and cut paper and mixed media, like just, but mainly everything on paper. I, I love paper and the sound of it and the feel of it. So yeah, I try to minimize how much I have to start over, but that's why I love collage because you can always just go over again and again. Yeah, yeah for me, um, pencil on paper is my, my favorite or you know, ballpoint pen or just a regular pen on paper. Um, I do have a favorite, which was in high school, I did a lot of colored pencil drawings. And so I'm really comfortable with colored pencil. So I like black colored pencil on newsprint, but unfortunately it's like the worst quality paper you could ever get, but there's nothing that feels like it. It's really soft and textured and it just feels really nice with the colored pencil. And in terms of reworking things, oh, incessantly, I'm just like redrawing and redrawing and redrawing, but also like Bianca, you know, it's if it's a small thumbnail sketch, I try to catch it, the changes at the earlier stage so that it's not as uh, time consuming. So as you're doing all of these redrawings, where do you get your inspiration or what inspires you to keep coming back to the pages? I say life, my like real people, my real life, life experiences, all with that. Yeah, I would agree. Life and just the people that I know and my the young members of my family and wanting to make books where they see themselves in it. Yeah, I mean, I could say the same. I think the only thing I would add is, uh, where I'm from, like my place. So, you know, being from El Paso is, has a big influence on my work, uh, not only in the techniques that I'm using and the way that I draw things, but in terms of the colors and the characters, the iconography that I use. You know, I'm grateful to have uh, 
a niece, some nieces and nephews that are really influential in my work for young readers. You know, I, I think about my conversations with them and it influences my work. You mentioned El Paso and your local environment really inspiring you. What about your very small environments, your studio spaces, especially since I'm guessing, like most of us, you're spending more time at home in those spaces right now. What inspires you there? I'm really hoping someone mentions the toys. I mean, definitely the toys and having like these little things around me um, and my books, like being able to look through all these books when I'm thinking of something or just like, oh, they did something like this. I kind of want to do that. And then just like grabbing things from here and there and mixing them up. Um, yeah, it's a lot of inspiration from other illustrators and writers. Yeah, mine's the same. I'll jump in. Sorry, Juana. Um, yeah, I mean, so since I recently moved, all my books are in boxes still, and they've been that way for months. And it's been really tough because as you saw in some of the photos, I, you know, I have a nice uh, bookshelf. And that for me is always a place of, you know, resource, right? It's like going to my own little library. So if there's a problem that I'm dealing with, with a certain panel or something, or a certain spread, excuse me, um, I like to look at books, but it's been difficult in this time. Um, but I think I've just been drawing smaller and just trying to deal with what I have here with these few books and there's a, some on the floor here behind me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that my, my studio's at the end of a house. So that walk from my bedroom through the kitchen, through the dining room, you know, through all the house to get into my space, I think that gets me into that mood. And, and I automatically turn that on that now I'm working, I'm on, I'm, I'm in my, this is business hours. <laughs> uh, so that is a big part of, I have to, I force myself to be in that mood because some days because of the pandemic, some days are really difficult to work. It really is. Um, but then I have like, like um, books, you know, I reference books, I reference, you know, one thing I do a lot is uh, patterns, either fabric or uh, floral, or, you know, I just think about the book that I'm working on, and then what patterns were, I can relate to it. And then that's a big source of inspiration. Too. Well, I really like that connection with patterns. So we have a question about working with authors. When you're working with someone else's words, how do you ensure that those words can come to life in your pictures? And how much input or collaboration do you have with the author and then possibly also with other members of the editorial team like the art director? Zeke, do you wanna start this one since I know you do collaborate with your author? Yeah, I've had the benefit of you know uh, having a good collaborative uh, relationship with my friend Isabel Quintero. And I, I kind of don't know anything different because also in my personal work, working with the community, it's been very collaborative. But, you know, that process for me as an illustrator and dealing with a specific story, that collaboration is key to me, right? So I need to be able to ask that person questions. So Isa, Isabel and I will have conversations about, you know, how should this character look? What would this character be wearing in, in my papi as a motorcycle, there are specific things that Isabel made decision, decisions on, right? And myself as an illustrator, I wanna be open to that because it's her story and I wanna honor, honor that story by letting the person who knows the story best uh, make some of those important decisions for the characters and the world. Can you give a specific example of something she was invested in in the book? It, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a small, you know, it's a small little detail, but in the book, Daisy Ramona is wearing Vans, uh, Vans <laughs> shoes, the, the skate shoes. And I remember when we were having that conversation, I would, you know, because Isabel and I are texting back and forth. Uh, every once in a while, it'll be an email if I have to show a sketch or something. But most of the time, it's on the phone. Um, and I remember asking, you know, like, hey, well, I had, I think I had some other different shoes on there and I was like, well, as I was doing the character design, this was really early on. I asked her, well, what, what would Daisy and I want to be wearing? And she, she knew like right away, she's like black vans. That's what she would be wearing. And for me, it was like, it made sense. Cause I remember being young and like skate, skate culture was like really on the rise when, when we were that age. And so, uh, yeah, I always wanted the vans too, but I only ever had the converse. <laughs> Grown-up aspirations. Maybe yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Lives. How about you, Bianca? I know you in the video you talked about your art director a little bit. Yeah, I uh, had a 
close working relationship with my art director, um, Susan Sherman for the One Day House. Um, and that was really great. And she was so kind of patient. It was my debut book. So kind of walking me through the process. Um, it was wonderful. And I think it's great to have a connection with the author. Um, the way that I worked on this book was we were kept very separate. Um, I think that's how a lot of books work, I think nowadays, um, especially because I don't know the author and like they picked me through my portfolio. So that was an interesting process. And I did like that it gave me a lot of uh, opportunity to put my own voice into it and bring other ideas into it. Um, and it was freeing, but I also moving forward and more so working with the authors directly now and finding that to be very important just to feel that, like Zeke said, like I'm really expressing like the voice um, that they bring to it, like giving, you know, life to their story in the truest way possible. Mm -hmm. What about you, Juana? How is it when you're working with your, illustrating your own words or someone else's? Uh, I think that the process of um, when I'm working with somebody else's word words, uh, like a manuscript, and I'm only the illustrator, it's very streamlined to me. I see the images, I know what they look like, I know where they live, what pets they have, it's very, very clear. And when I'm working on my books, I could get easily lost because I have so many options. I mean, like I could do it, literally, I could do anything I want. And that's what, you know, sometimes I take longer, not sometimes, I always take longer on my books. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that when I sketch, I sketch and then I have many questions. I have many, many questions. And I when I submit my sketches to the art director and the editor, I will post my questions because I know I don't have all the answers. There are mm -hmm. things like, you know, there will be another culture or maybe questions directly to the author about these, if it's an unfinished mm -hmm. book about this particular person and all of that. So I, I love the back and forth. I love working on my own and then posting all the questions because I always have questions, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think this is a terrific place to take a pause and watch a video about your process. We've now seen where you work and now find out a little bit more about how you create the books. Hi, so now I'll show you about my process for the One Day House or La Casa de Algún Día, which it got translated this year into Spanish, which makes me happy. So these are all from Google Earth. So I just use this to kind of help me map out like where everything will be. This is across the street from Gigi's house. So I did this and this is like that building. This is like that one. I picked some of the ones that were a bit different from the real thing, like this one. I think the note was that he's too far and disinterested looking. We want to show their bond right away, which I think was a really good note. And this one's pretty much the same comparatively. But it was originally like this when I sketched it. And they didn't like, they looked like he was in pain, which I wanted to show like her pan is broken so she's playing really bad, but we kind of reworked it. This is the cover. And then I did it in color, trying to figure out, like, so you could see how, like, collage it is. Like, there's so much doing it over and over. And then I was trying to figure out, like, how the cover will look. So I did, like, different skies. And I settled on yellow, but there was, like, a couple options that I tried. My editor, art director Susan Sherman, I mean, she was amazing. She really helped me figure out the process. This is my first published children's book. You could just see some of the how the notes look. So this is one page. Susan would write her notes here. It's hard to remember everything as the illustrator, so I really appreciate working with an art director. It took maybe almost two years, um, but I was also in grad school at the time. Um, but it was a long process, and I appreciated like the intense care that people put into it, and I'm really grateful. I um, work in this room um, uh, every day, at least five days a week. 
So this is my uh, computer table. Uh, I do my writing. Uh, even though I, I am a traditional artist and I do all my sketches by hand, I put all the sketches together in Photoshop. And that's my working table. My working table changes depending on what I'm doing. Right now I'm working on sketches. So all I keep is pencils and paper. If I'm painting, then I will have my acrylics, my paint, my water, my palette and all of that. If I'm pre-making, it will be the inks. Now, once everything is done, I start hanging all my work in, the, in these clotheslines that I have throughout the whole studio to wall above my desk. Finishing and hanging my piece and putting it right there so I can see it every day. So I thought I would spend some time uh, talking a little bit about the process of designing uh, the characters of Daisy and Papi in My Papi Has a Motorcycle. You can see some of the sketches, early sketches of Daisy um, and Papi, and Papi looks really funky here. He looks really weird here. Um, and, you know, as I moved on in the sketches for Papi, you know, I started really exaggerating some of the features um, and really pushing the anatomy to really make a caricature of what I thought Poppy was going to look like. Before I even get to working on the page, um, I draw these characters uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 times, sometimes 100 times, um, just to really, you know, be sure that I can draw the character over and over again. I like to show these sketches because it just shows anyone who's trying to become an illustrator or, or who is interested in it that your first sketches are, are not going to be good and they shouldn't be good, but that's part of the process. It's a matter of you know repetition and really trying to figure things out until you can kind of get to the point where you're able to draw a character over you know several pages to make sure that you can you know, get the expression right. I was really happy with the way, you know, these characters turned out. I have fun drawing them, which is also really important. I, I love this spread because you see our main characters in three different places on one spread. One, two, and three up at the top. And when I was making this book, I tried to um, use comics as a visual storytelling method. So I use uh, multiple panels on the page um, to tell the story. And I really like this spread because it shows that really clearly that we see them moving through the scene. There's a really fun jukebox. There's this guy waving and then they're taking off. Um, so that gives you a look, a little bit of insight into my process for designing characters, uh, which for me is, is one of the most important parts of the process of illustrating a book. That was fascinating. So as Juana, Bianca, and Zeke come back and you continue to share your questions in the chat, I'm going to go back to one from last time from a former EJK selection committee member. She'd like to know how your choice in media for a project affects the feel and process of that project. I can go ahead first. <clears throat> I, I am a mixed media artist and I truly believe that each book will have a different, a different feel uh, overall, a mood, you know, uh, and that's, uh, that, to me, that's seen by through the palette, through the choice of paper, through the size, and also through the technique that you use. Uh, for example, if you were to look at Alma, it was the whole idea of Alma was to remind you of photo albums, uh, old photo albums. And that's why I made them all black and white, right? While in Sonia, to represent the rainforest. And for that, I thought that using a different paper, handmade paper made of, you know, banana tree bark and using uh, printmaking was the perfect choice for that particular book. So I do believe that it is very tied to what the message you're trying to give in your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree that the medium dictates all of it. What's at the heart of it is the narrative, right? Um, I've made work where there's one story and then I've made a painting of it, a comic of it, 
and you know like a digital illustration off of it you know and so so i think that uh there's many choices that you can make and each one i think has its own way of reflecting uh themes and concepts in the story yeah i um agree it has a lot to do with like the connecting the whole work what you materials you use and like for the one day house i used a uh, handmade paper also that was made from collecting garbage around my neighborhood um and it really smells now <laughs> when i uh, i still have it but uh at the time i didn't care about that and it just like uh made it like the journey of collecting that and then like blending it into a pulp and then um just i i'm also like zeke said earlier i'm really inspired by my neighborhood that i'm from in chicago um from pilsen and just like getting that garbage that i kind of grew up all around um and putting it into the book it's really helped me ground myself in that story and like feel like i'm bringing in all those aspects of like living in that neighborhood into the art itself so i feel like yeah the materials like really um like tie the book together a couple people are curious about your first experiences as authors and illustrators. So what was it like working on that first book or pitching your artwork for that first book? For illustration, my first book was La Madre Goose, which is this one right here. And um, I was very scared because I had been pursuing, hoping to illustrate picture books for a, for a few years by then. So I was, I was excited, but at the same time, I was very, very, very afraid of speaking my mind, which was a mistake. So if there's any out of you that are there, please, if you feel something is off and if you need to you know, pass that to the editor or the art director, please speak up, your voice matters. The reason they pick you is because they want your voice in that book. So with La Madre Goose, I was very afraid. So, and I think that reflects in the work. I was very nervous of losing my project and losing that chance of working. With Alma, it was just, I was just, I just didn't think that book was going to do that well because it was too personal. I never thought that it was a great story. Um, I never understood why why it was getting you know anything <laughs> really yeah yeah, yeah I, I had somewhat of a similar experience i think i mean i've been self-publishing work for a long time right uh, online comics uh, publishing little zines um making weird like audio comic book things um but when i finally you know published a, an actual you know book with a publisher was photographic the life of Graciela Iturbide which was also written by um, Isabel Quintero and um, that I, I was fortunate that it was a comic book because it was something that I was very used to I was very uh, you know used to making work in that mode and telling story in that mode and I think that uh, it really was just this other element of having someone else write the story and then having the photographs put in. But like Juana, you know, with my papi has a motorcycle, it felt more personal. Um, it, it felt like, you know, Isabel was very, you know, gracious in allowing me enough space to also put a little bit of myself in there, which I think is an important thing. For me as an illustrator, I wanna have that personal connection. And so I think, but I, I was a little timid about it, right? I was like, can, can I draw in this style? Like, is it okay for me to draw in a more cartoonish style? Because I think over the years of doing painting and this sort of thing, I, I felt this obligation to draw realistically or draw a particular way. But when I normally draw, it's this, my papi has a motorcycle, it felt very connected to the way that I drew in that book. Yeah, um, I felt, I guess, I'm st I feel like I'm still sort of new. Uh, this is my first published book and then I have one that's coming out in March, but it got delayed because of uh, the pandemic. Um, so I still feel like I'm sort of like, I thought that was really great advice from Juana, like to speak up for yourself and like say when you feel something. Um, Cause I was also like afraid to kind of say everything that I think um, when it came to illustrating this book. But I do feel like uh, everything that I wanted to say did get out there and it was great to work with um, Susan Sherman and everyone at Charles Bridge. It was a great experience and um, I would like to be an author of my own books and I do have some stories that I've been like editing for several years and like 
um, pitching and then getting notes from editors and rejections and like going back to the drawing board. And that is a long process or it has been for me. Um, like telling stories and pictures for me comes so much easier and like just feeling emotions and being able to show that in an image rather than like explaining it with words is much harder for me, but uh, it's something I really want to do and look forward to doing in the future. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's like um, not always an easy process. You just have to keep trying and doing it and uh, failing and then trying again. Mm -hmm. And as someone who thinks very much in words, I'm always so completely amazed at how illustrators and artists are able to think in those images and pictures and colors. So we have a question. Have you ever been in a situation where you've needed to reconsider how your story and imagery may be viewed by a child or a family in a particularly marginalized community or situation? And if so, do you have a process for that kind of self-editing or thinking through how your artwork might be received by children in marginalized communities? You know, being from a marginalized community, I, I'm not sure that I think objectively about being in a marginalized community. What I, what I do do is I think objectively about young readers and I try to be very intentional about the choices that I make with regard to cultural things, uh, things that have to do with ethnicity, race, class, all of those, you know, uh, concepts that are at play in our society. So, um, but you know, the best I can do is to think critically, to have conversation, to surround myself with people like a collaborator and Isabel and editors that are willing to have those difficult conversations and to call out things that are problematic. I think that it's just a matter of, of being intentional about it, trying to speak from the most honest place. And I think something that I'm recently trying to practice, which is trying to start first in terms of the process for that is starting first with understanding where I am at in a relationship to a story, right? If it's uh, dealing with a certain issue that I'm not familiar with, I, I need to understand that. I need to understand the privilege that I have and recognize that so that I can move forward and knowing if I'm the right person to tell the story in the first place. Yeah, it's something that I think about a lot. Um myself being from a Mexican American like working class neighborhood like my family's um my grandparents immigrated to that neighborhood from Mexico and I at the same like so I try to tell those stories of my community that I grew up in but at the same time I realized like I'm um like very light-skinned and like white presenting so I like constantly kind of try to think about that and think about like my privilege and where I'm like accessing these stories and um just like making sure I'm talking to my family and like editors and like um, other friends and artists, like trying to say like, get second opinions and see like, yeah, like is this, um, I guess, inappropriate in any way or am I reaching beyond my experience um, in any way? So that is something that I think about a lot with uh, children's books. Um, as soon as I receive a manuscript, I need to feel very strongly about it or I just, cannot be working on that story. So the, the minute that I choose to think that story is because I find that I'll be able to find add my perspective to that. Now, with that said, I truly dis, dislike the word marginalized because we need to think, I, I like to call, I prefer to call I prefer to say underrepresented as opposed to marginalized, because if we think about the word marginalized, who's doing the marginalizations? Uh, with that in mind, um, I truly believe that there's a lot that I'm learning and I will continue to learn. So I have to approach the book in the space and time that I'm at that moment. Perhaps in 10 years, I'll look at a, at a book and go, how did I do this? But I can only work with the knowledge that I have now. Now having a group of people, and, and that's why, you know, making a book is, it takes a village <laughs> because you have all these questions, right? Uh, am I using the right language when, I, when I'm using this word in this illustration? Am I using the right, the right perspective? Am I, am I using the idea of the concept of, the names of the countries 
from the perspective of after the discovery, you wrote so-called discovery, right? Am I being, am I following these colonial ideas, you know? Um, so all we can do is work with what we have now and surround ourselves with people who know more than us um, and then ask lots of questions, lots and lots of questions. That's how I approach my work. This has been such a rich conversation. You're right, Juana. Thank you for pointing out that distinction about how much word choice matters. What's in the illustration matters, certainly. But yes, every word we use, underrepresented and marginalized, both carry different connotations and different backstories. So thank you so much for reminding us of the importance of every word choice and every art choice, especially when we're putting them into books for children. Before we wrap up, I wanna make sure that we have a chance to look at the future a little bit as well. So can each of you let me know what you're working on right now? I'll, sure. I'll jump in. Okay. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, yeah. you go, you go. No, no, first time you wanted to go first, go for it. <laughs> okay, uh, right now I'm working um, with someone that I've worked with in the past. Her name is Miriam Kaba, and she's an amazing activist and just uh, she founded Project Nia in Chicago and she's from New York but um, she's a prison abolitionist and works to end uh, juvenile incarceration which is something I'm very passionate about and really believe in. Um, so I'm we're going to self-publish a book together um, and I'm really excited about that project. It's been uh, lovely to work with her again. I'm uh, currently um writing some stories of my own stuff that I've been working on for several years. Um, and uh, they're, they're personal stories, family stories. And then as, as always is the case, I'm always balancing community work with publishing work or, con or uh, freelance work. And so right now I'm finishing up a project with a small farm, um, La Semilla in Southern New Mexico. It's in Anthony, New Mexico. And it's a short um, comic about uh, the farm bill and the way that the farm bill impacts our food system. So it's a, uh, uh, La Semilla is a food center that, that does work around uh, food justice. This one, uh, La, Selva de, La Selva de Sonia or Sonia's Rainforest coming uh, March 30th. And then I'm working on the book with, as I mentioned on the video, the book with Patma Lakshmi, uh, Tomatoes for Nila that will both come out next year. So yes, all of you are definitely keeping busy right now. Some amazing stuff coming up. What do you think is going to happen with publishing, especially publishing for children in the next few years? I mean, we're at such an interesting point in terms of COVID and the stronger push for anti-racism in children's literature. What do you think the next few years look like? I only know my work and I will continue to try to push my work. And I hope that this will move many, many, many author, illustrators, editors, publisher, publicists, books, booksellers, you know, everyone to be, try to op, um, widen who they work with and for whom and with whom they work. So we get more and more inclusive, but again, I mean, inclusive according to whom, right? So a, a more wide body of people. <laughs> As of a year, I've been working part-time as an art director for Cinco Puntos Press. And so I've I experienced, you know, exactly what the implications were for the pandemic. Um, and it's, you know, for, for an independent publisher, it's been difficult. Um, but I think, you know, as Juana said, we just, we have what we have here and you just try to move forward with it. Um, I think in terms of more broadly, like publishing, I'm very grateful for all of the conversation that's happening right now. Um, the conversation centered around Black Lives Matter and the need for that social change. And, you know, I, I'm grateful to have those conversations. I think that it's important for us to, you know, when, I, when I'm getting requests to do work um, as an illustrator, you know, I, I, and as a storyteller, I guess, I see it as my responsibility to have those critical conversations and to ha ask critical questions. Who is telling the story? Is this the right person to be telling this story? Am I the right person to be illustrating that story? And I, I think that if we can have those critical conversations of acknowledging uh, where we're at, right, and our entry point to those stories, 
I think that it can only benefit to bring more illustrators and creators forward, right? Like um, a, a part of what I try to do is also know when to step out of the way and when to hold the door open, which is always, um, but mostly when to step out of the way, right? And not to consume all of the opportunity and resource so that the people who are the right people to tell those stories can have the opportunity to do so and the support from the publishing industry. I mean, just in terms of like, will children still need books? I think always and probably now more than ever. Um, and it's the time I think when parents and kids are spending more time together than ever. And I think books are always helpful in that process. Like I, I don't know, like when I was a kid, my mom would always be like, where'd Yanka go? And then and she'd find me like with books all over the floor before I could even <laughs> read, like just quietly reading um, in my room. So I think books will always be around. Um, and I think it is a hard time for publishing, but um, I, yeah, I don't know as much about that side, but I'm just hopeful that I can just keep doing what I love. And um, I guess if we all support like these different uh, smaller publishing houses and bookstores, then uh, we can together make sure it continues to happen. Mm -hmm. We've also gotten a couple questions about self-publishing. Zeke, this may be a good one to start with you. Do you think that self-publishing is going to continue to expand in the foreseeable future, especially in light of what we just talked about? Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine, right? I think that on the positive side of things, we all are becoming very familiar with technology and, and you know, Zooming and knowing how to use those, those resources and those tools. And, you know, I, re I really look at the, the younger generations if I'm doing a youth workshop um, and understanding that their way of telling story and their way of understanding the world is so much different from ours. And I think that the digital technology that, that's, you know, at our fingertips is going to be a huge thing for self-publishing as, as it's already proven to be. And I think that that's only a, a good thing, right? Like I think to what Bianca was saying, having the independent publishers and all the smaller, you know, independent publishers are what offer, you know, um, uh, uh, that full that fuller spectrum of stories um, and anyone who is self-publishing I would encourage you just to keep doing it I think that when I did get the opportunity to publish and sell a project um, the experience of self-publishing was vital in that process of me being able to bring it to completion and um, you know I see it as I see it important uh, you know to also work outside of these uh large you know, industries that have been around for a lot of years because they can come with a lot of baggage as we've seen in the past year. Thank you so much for this conversation. You've given me so many ideas to take back to my students and to continue having the conversation about children's books now and in the future. Zeke, Juana, and Bianca and I are now going to say goodbye to all of you. Thank you again for joining us. And then we're going to turn it back over to Deborah for a few final remarks about the 35th anniversary of the EJK Award. It's all Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramona. And thank you, Zeke, Bianca, and Juana for a wonderful discussion. It moved seamlessly from a conversation about how your physical environment affects your creative process to how the social and political environment affects your thinking and therefore your creative process. I was particularly taken, uh, Juana, by your pointing out that the use of the phrase marginalized population automatically implies that there is another population at the center. And once we know that, we can recognize that we don't want to send that message. I was also struck by the fact that all three of you consider self-awareness, sensitivity, and an openness to the thoughts and opinions of others as central to your way of making books for children. Books that I do believe will become the classics of the future. So thank you, uh, Zeke, Bianca, and Juana for welcoming us into your studio and for sharing so much of your creative process and your thinking with us. And thank you, Ramona, for being an extraordinary host through the discussion. Special thanks always to our creative 
EJK team. Diana Voza, Robin Stein, Jocelyn McCarthy, and Riot Intraub. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and please visit our website, where you'll find a host of information about events coming up in our Ezra Jack Keats Award 35th Anniversary Campaign Year.